My name is Erin Mosba. Hey. I'm the food and nutrition editor at Livestrong.com, and welcome to the Best Diet for Mind and Body panel. This panel will be about how your the relationship between your diet and your mental and emotional health. What we want you to get out of this panel is how what you eat affects your mind and body, so you can make smarter choices every day. Um, so we have an amazing panel today. The first person I'm going to introduce is Kelly Levesque. She's a celebrity nutritionist and the best-selling author of Body Love. Her clients include Jessica Alba, Jennifer Gardner, Chelsea Handler, and Emmy Rossum. Max Lugavier, who's right to my right, is a New York Times bestselling author of Genius Foods and host of the top-rated Genius Life podcast. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, Erin Polinsky wade is a registered dietitian and certified diabetes educator. She's the author of Belly Fat Diet for Dummies and a consultant for Swiss Wellness. Yay. And yeah. last but definitely not least is Kimberly Snyder, and she's a celebrity nutritionist and New York Times bestselling author. Thank you. I'm so <laughs> excited to get, have you guys all up here today. I love you too. <laughs> So my first question for everybody, and we can just go down the line starting with Kelly, you know, talk as much as you want. If you're like really enthused about a topic, go for it. Um, so do you have a food that you think is magical? For example, a food you feel has amazing benefits, so you try to eat it as often as possible. Um, I do actually. I would say that sardines top my charts um, in regards to nutritional density. So we're talking about what are you getting from a small amount of food. In regard, um, sardines are a great source of essential amino acids, essential fatty acids, vitamin D. Um, I also think they're pretty affordable. So when my clients are, you know, looking to save money or um, get a good source of protein in their diet, I think it's a great thing to add and. Trust me, I didn't love sardines the first time I ate them, but a little hot sauce goes a long way, and then you get used to it and you're good to go. Amazing. I love those Trader Joe's sardines. I always have them in my cupboard, I'm gonna say. Anyways, what about you, Erin? Um, no, I love sardines too, that's great. <laughs> so one of my uh, absolute favorite foods that I do think is a little bit magical that you don't really think about a lot, it's kind of underrated, is artichoke, globe artichoke. Um, a lot of people find that they're really intimidating to look at, but I find that they're, they're really great neutral flavors. So somebody that's maybe a little picky about getting more vegetables, like my husband, um, is really willing to try to eat them. And they're really rich in antioxidants. So you're getting a lot of vitamin C, you're getting vitamin K, you're getting folic acid, um, and then on top of it, they actually help the liver to produce and release more bile. So it's helping with the breakdown of fat in the small intestine. So it's if you're prone to like gas, to, um, constipation, bloating, it's a great food, especially if you've overindulged, like on the weekend, you want to add more artichokes. So um, I've been finding, you know, just roasting them. My kids actually eat a whole artichoke themselves. They're four in one, which is amazing. They don't really eat other vegetables. So it's just a sad, sad thing. Um, so I found them magical because they'll eat them too for those reasons. Awesome. Kimberly, what about artichoke. you? <laughs> Um, so for me, I think uh, a magical food, it's not a, a specific ingredient, but I'm really into smoothies. And I think what's really powerful about smoothies is that in essence, they're pre-digested. You throw all this stuff in the blender, you turn it on, it breaks down, because most people are so busy that we don't chew well enough. And we don't really, I always say we're not what we eat, but we are what we digest. And so when you have a smoothie, it's broken down, so it's able, you're able to really assimilate the nutrients. And I just think smoothies are really filling. I'm a fan of juice too. Juice got really popular, but juice isn't a whole food anymore. We're taking out the fiber. And I think fiber is what gives us sustained energy. It cleans us out, it detoxifies us. So I start my day with glowing green smoothies. I have power protein smoothies. I'm a busy mom. And I was, <laughs> Kelly's about to be a mom, Aaron's a mom. Um, so I give smoothies to my two-year-old. I have them for myself on the go. I don't always have time to cook, but I can throw things in. I can make a, you know, power protein smoothie with protein power and chia seeds and a bunch of things and know I'm getting a lot of nutrition. So I think in our busy world where we need more nutrition, we need more um, antioxidants and more detoxifying properties, smoothies can be your best friend. Great. Man, well, yes. I... <laughs> GG has power. My answer might be a little controversial, but I welcome uh, the, the debate. I'm going to say grass-fed beef. I'm uh, looking out 
and I'm, uh, I'm noticing a lot of lovely ladies. And uh, you know, there's a really cool study that came out of the Food and Mood Center at Deakin University that found that women that didn't eat the nationally recommended three to four servings of beef uh, per week were twice as likely to be diagnosed with a major mood disorder. And women that ate more than that amount were also at increased risk. So it was a very interesting dose response. And when they analyzed the data, they found that that relationship between uh, three to four servings of, of beef and stronger mental health didn't exist for any other form of protein meaning chicken, pork, or uh, fish. So I have no affiliation with any uh, meat company. I don't get paid by the beef industry. And that study actually was not funded by the beef industry, which is often a claim waged against pro-meat, you know, studies that happen to find a benefit of consuming meat. Um, and so I think, you know, for all people, but especially women, you know, it's an it's a incredibly nutrient-dense source of the most bioavailable source of iron, zinc, choline, protein, DHA, uh, and EPA fat. Again, grass-fed is important. I do not endorse factory farmed meat in any way. Um, but I just think it's a, it's, a, it's a health food and it gets sort of you know, a bad rap. Yeah, and but. I like that you're talking about how there's a difference between factory farmed meat that just has you know, terrible antibiotics and growth hormones in it and humanely raised meat that's good for you and grass-fed. Yes. Really? <laughs> so if I could just respond, and I, I don't think there's one right way. I think it's important that we hear all the information and decide what's best for us. Um, my perspective is that, you know, there's this Ayurvedic saying, which is the oldest medical system on the planet, that says, so is the micro, as is the macro. So the one thing I do want to bring up that can't be argued, it's beyond nutrition and health, is that from an environmental standpoint, grass-fed, free-range animals are d d responsible for about 90% of rainforest destruction, deforestation, and it's just the reality. So it's not all or nothing, but just, you know, what affects us does affect the world. And I think that, you know, there's, there's a lot of different studies that can argue, you know, different points. There's a lot of studies in support of plant-based now as well. I've been plant-based for 13 years. I'm very happy. So I think... <laughs> I think, you know, there are foods, there are many different foods that affect different people. Again, I don't think it's all or nothing, but I think we have to decide what's right for us, what feels good to us, and Absolutely. that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> Great. Um, so this kind of correlates to my qu next question. Which foods do you think are the opposite of magical in that they have the potential to cause, ha cause harm to the mind and body? Who wants to go first? Kelly, do you want to start again? Sure. Okay. Um, I think you can look at three different types of groups, and I know Max and I agree on this. Um, sugar, industrial seed oils, and acellular carbohydrates from grains, um, because they're really destructive not only to the microbiome and when it comes to the gut-brain axis and depression, anxiety, stress-related disorders, um, they contribute a lot to that bodily inflammation that can create depression. And so looking to look at those food groups, eat less of those foods, and really make the choice to have a clean source of them occasionally is kind of how I coach my clients. Awesome. Yeah, I agree with that. I think you have to look at the moderation and what's going to be practical for life. And so one of the biggest things I try to tell my clients too is just added sugar. I feel like added sugar in the diet is the biggest downfall. And when we had the push towards low fat and everybody was having way more carbs and simple carbs, it's just really wreaking havoc on health and inflammation and even the gut health because about 80 to 90 percent of the serotonin production is coming from the gut. And so if we're you know not eating foods that are supporting gut health, we're finding a decline in mood and even the serotonin link with sleep. It affects and increases the for insomnia. So, you know, looking at the statistics on added sugar, we find that the recommendation for the American Heart Association, which is still a little high, is about six teaspoons a day for women of added sweetener, nine teaspoons a day for men of added sweetener. Most of us get about 26 teaspoons of added sweetener a day, which is just shocking and horrible for our health. So you really, really have to be a smart consumer and look at what you're getting. You know, don't be fooled by the outer package if it says something's organic. You know, or I have clients come in with organic candy. It's still candy. It's still just added. <laughs> sugar, unfortunately. Um, raw sugar, it's still sugar. So you really have to look at what you're getting. And the more you can cut back, try more whole foods, and really get away from too much processed foods, I think you're going to be better off. Kimberly? <laughs> um, 
So the opposite of magical, I, you know, in my philosophy, I say that nature is our biggest teacher, Mother Nature. And so one thing that I've noticed in myself, again, everybody's body's different, but one thing that I've seen across the board when I pull it out of people's diets, their skin tends to get better, their energy goes up, is dairy. And that's because dairy in nature is really created for a baby cow. A cow is a very different animal. It has four chambers to its stomach. It grows to be five to 700 pounds. Um, it has a very different enzymatic structure in the way it digests food. Um, so I find there's so many amazing dairy alternatives. There's hemp milk, there's coconut milk, there's almond cheese, there's amazing brands like Kite Hill making cheese. I was a huge cheese lover. It took me two years to get off cheese myself. But I find that when I take it out, I have more energy, I don't feel as dull, it's very mucus forming, I just feel a lot more energy and I've seen that with a lot of people. Um, and again, it's not all or nothing, some people still want to keep some kefir in or yogurt or whatever, um, but I would pay attention to how much dairy people have. Um, and I love, I love our panel, like my, my beautiful friends here, I love that we can have this discussion. So just to get, I think it's always good to have a different perspective. I also want to say to, um, what you guys were talking about, just so you guys see the other side too. I am someone that eats a lot of grains. <laughs> I eat a lot of carbs. I'm a very big carb eater. I read all the paleo books. I've read Grain Brain and all that. I totally respect the research. Um, I think it goes back to how we feel in our body. I've tried Atkins. I've tried versions where I gave up grains altogether, and I personally didn't feel as good. I didn't have as much energy. I felt like I was obsessing about my diet. So I'm gluten-free. I take digestive enzymes. I soak my grains but I do, I do eat them. And I will say, as a student of Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine, there's still billions of people in the world that do very well with grains. So that's just another um, side. Again, it's not all or nothing. You could just do it a little bit. You could do it more like me if it feels good. But I would just say to really listen to your body because there isn't one perfect diet for everybody. Awesome. <laughs> here, here. Um, I would say... Uh, I'm really um, anti-grain and seed oils. Um, when I did a deep dive into the biochemistry of them for my book, uh, Genius Foods, I was really shocked to learn that even organic non-GMO canola oil that you buy at a big health food chain um, has up to 5% trans fats in them. Have you guys all heard of trans fats? Raise your hand if you have, yeah. There's no safe level of trans fat consumption for human beings. Um, even, you know, small amounts have been related to worse memory function in young and healthy people. Uh, they promote inflammation in your veins and arteries. And, you know, a hundred years ago, polyunsaturated seed oils made up 0% of the human diet. Today, they make up about 10 to 20%. A hundred years ago, we didn't have the chemistry sets, the labs or the machinery to extract fat from corn or from soybeans, whereas human beings have been making extra virgin olive oil for thousands of years. How? Because to make extra virgin olive oil, you crush olives. To make avocado oil, you squeeze avocados, right? But to make the types of oils that our diets have become awash in, like canola oil, corn oil, soybean oil, grapeseed oil, we need the equivalent of like a Walter White chemistry set to, uh, to create these oils. And they all undergo a step called deodorization. And deodorization, what that does is it makes these oils odorless and tasteless. And also to ha it allows them to have a high smoke point because it removes any kind of solid from them. And manufacturers love this because it allows them to use the same oil in a granola bar, in a salad dressing, in a pasta dish, they use it to fry chicken with. But that deodorization step actually creates trans fats um, in, these, uh, in these oils. And the latest uh, in the journal BMJ analysis of um, you know, the associations between different types of fats and uh, all-cause mortality, which is early death by any cause, found no relationship between saturated fat consumption, for example, and early death, but they did find an increased risk of death um, due to trans fat consumption. So again, you know, these trans fats are lurking in these oils that our food supplies become awash in, and so for that reason, I would say that they're uh, top offenders. 
Yeah, and it's amazing, you know, the more you educate yourself about what the food industry is able to do with modern science and modern chemistry, you kind of know what to look out for. Yeah. And it really is a game of like protecting yourself against yeah. that and marketing and, you know, the more knowledge you have, right? The more you know. Exactly, the more you know. So my next question, um, I think I'm gonna go the opposite way this time. What would you eat for breakfast on a day when you have something really important to do? Like a TV appearance or, you know, um, appearing on a stronger weekend panel? <laughs> oh man, my answer, what I would eat for breakfast on a day where I had something important to do, I would say nothing. I uh, usually try to stack my mornings um, with uh, the most important things that I need to do, the left brain, you know, sort of more analytical, uh, you know, tasks requiring um, my executive function to be really firing on all cylinders. Um, and when we are fasted, our body, our brains are actually primed to be at their most clever. You know, as a hunter-gatherer, we wouldn't have made it very far as a species if we got less clever when food ceased to be available, right? So we know that certain neurotransmitters like orexin A become elevated in the brain. These neurotransmitters are involved in alertness. So usually uh, I won't eat anything um, until around noon or so once I get that stuff out of the way. But I will drink maybe a cup of green tea or a cup of coffee, something like that. Awesome. What about you, Kimberly? So I, um, I'm a very big proponent of a morning practice and it's the same whether it's a normal day or today when I'm speaking with you amazing beauties, um, which is I start with hot water with lemon in the morning, which uh, hydrates us. We often get dehydrated through the night and we wanna start on an up. So I always tell my clients and readers before you reach for the coffee, even if you're gonna have some, but it's good to give yourself that lemon, which is uh, clinical research has shown it does help to support liver tissue, which is our main fat burning organ and detoxifying organ. It's just going to give you a burst of vitamin C. And then the next thing I have is my glowing green smoothie. <laughs> so back to the smoothies again. Um, I, in the morning, I always say it's like New Year's every day. So we're waking up with the sun. We have this opportunity to feel amazing and to go into the day. And when you have whole foods, so my glowing green smoothie is about 70% green. It's very greens based. The base is water, lemon juice, and some high fiber fruit. So you're not having concentrated fat and protein. It doesn't take up a lot of energy, but it gives you sustained energy. I wake up quite hungry in the morning. Um, so the smoothie gives me this sus, you know, this substance. It gives me something, but it doesn't weigh me down. Um, it also gets me to lunch. I feel really great. Um, I feel like since I started having it, everything's cleared up, my digestion, my bloating. I used to be this like, you know, protein person which thought in the morning I had to have egg white omelets or you know, something to spur my um, metabolism. But since I changed to the glow and green smoothie, it does have an element of intermittent fasting and that again, we're not having the concentrated fat and protein, but we are having a ton of minerals and vitamins and fiber and it's just giving you this injection of nutrition in the morning. So every day I have that, and I give it to my son, Bubby, too. Yum. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Erin? Yeah, What's so um, I also am big on breakfast in the morning, too. And I think it's another, it's to know your body and know what really feels best for you. Um, I like to start off my day, too, with water, but I actually go with ice-cold water because, to me, I'm not, uh, I don't like to rely on caffeine for a burst of energy, but that really cold temperature just makes me more alert. Plus, I find that the hydration, too, I feel like once I'm getting more water in the body, and I feel the same with my clients, is it just, it gives you a bit of an energy boost. Um, I also, too, I wake up really hungry in the morning, so by having that fluid first thing in the morning, it fills you up so you can make a bit of a better choice if I'm just really hungry when I wake up and I'm on the go, I don't want to make an impulse choice where it might not fuel my day. Um, generally, what I recommend for breakfast, and I try to follow these principles for myself, is to have some kind of some, a food that's high in fiber and then either protein or fat just to fuel me so I'm, I'm satisfied for a few hours, I have sustained energy, and I'm not finding I'm getting a lot of cravings or wanting to grab things on the go. Uh, so one of my easiest go-tos is I like to do um, vegetarian fed eggs, and then I like to blend it with some sa sauteed vegetables. What I usually do with the vegetables is I'll prep them once a week, because everybody, you know, who has time to make vegetables every single morning, right? So I'll usually, uh, once a week, maybe on Sunday, I'll whip up a batch of vegetables, I leave them in the fridge, and then you can just toss them in with the egg, and then pair it with a piece of fruit or more vegetable on the side. But that usually makes me to feel really well, I'm getting that boost of antioxidants, and I'm staying sustained for a few hours. 
Okay, so um, I'm on the smoothie train, um, but I'm also on the fasting train. I think people read a lot about how you ha the breakfast is the most important meal of the day and you have to start it right away the minute you wake up. And a lot of my clients don't wake up very hungry. Um, so I always say, eat when you're hungry. And for me personally, knowing I'm gonna be on stage here today, I did have breakfast um, and I had my Fab Four smoothie. So I'm really a proponent of turning off hunger hormones and elongating a blood sugar curve. So for example, fat in a smoothie releases cholecystokinin, which is the satiety blanket that makes us feel cozy and elongates our blood sugar curve so that we're not spiking and crashing every three hours because new research suggests that the more that you eat these five to six small meals a day it's actually harder on your thyroid you're releasing more insulin it's heading you down the road to insulin resistance metabolic syndrome and a lot of the times those meals aren't um, nutritionally balanced so fat's important to me just to feel full and calm and relaxed um, protein for the same reason is actually, um, it comes about four hunger hormones that are related to craving sugar, craving carbohydrates. So a lot of times when I find that clients aren't getting enough protein, neuropeptide Y can scream at you, hey, the brownies are in the, you know, the office kitchen, why don't you go down there and get some? So I think for me personally, starting my day with protein is, is really important. Um, and it might not be at six in the morning when I wake up, it might be at 10. And, um, and that works for me, but I'm on board with the fiber big time because that will double cholecystokinin, that satiety hormone, and the physical stretching of your stomach is really, it plays a role in making you feel full. So when you're just grabbing a juice without the fiber and thinking that that's gonna make you full or your coffee, there's actual physical stretch receptors in your stomach that need to be stretched to calm your body and to feel full. So a mix of protein, fat, and fiber is sort of how I lean. Um, I try to limit excess sugar in the morning, even if it's coming from um, you know, fruit. If I'm having a carbohydrate, I normally like a tropical fruit, I would normally have it on its own, take advantage of the ability for my body to metabolize it a little bit faster and clear insulin faster, because insulin is one of those hormones that's going to not only slower halt fat burning, but it's also gonna make you feel uh, like you have a lot of cravings. So I tend to be, try to get out of my own way, satisfy my body on a biological level, and then get through my day. That really is reassuring to me because there's sometimes I wake up and I'm like, I'm not hungry until noon. And I respect that and I don't eat. And there's sometimes when I'm starving and I need a smoothie packed with almond butter and spinach and orange, you know? To each their own. Exactly. Okay, so we've been talking a lot about protein. Um, I don't know if the answer is as simple as this, but how much protein should we be consuming per day? And what percent of that protein should be from plant-based foods versus animal products? I'll let you start, Max, and then whoever needs to can chime in. I love this question because actually uh, I, was, I began thinking of it as Kelly was speaking. Um, there's this theory that, we, that our hunger levels are actually driven by our requirement for protein. It's called the protein leverage hypothesis. And uh, I think this is really interesting because as a macronutrient, you know, for the majority of our, of our evolution, it was probably the one that was the most difficult to come by. And yet our bodies are made of protein. You know, we think about protein as being something that we eat, right? But we're actually constructed of protein. And so that's why, um, you know, I tend to reach for proteins uh, that don't have a lot of tag along calories from starch and fat. I mean, I think I stand apart from the, like, the movement towards a higher fat diet and the paleo diet because I don't actually even believe in eating a uh, high fat diet by necessity. I think it's a, a diet where you wanna just kinda think about the foods that you're eating and reach for foods that are higher in protein. When it comes to the amount of protein, um, I'm really interested in body composition and the latest research that I've reviewed uh, suggests that about 0.6 to 0.8 grams per pound of body weight. Um, so do the math. We've been told for decades, I sort of you know, became interested in this, uh, in health and wellness through the fitness angle. And you know, the notion that we need to eat tons and tons of protein throughout the day, that's also not necessarily true. You know, it's driven by people who produce uh, protein powders and things like that, right? And I take protein powders, nothing against the supplement industry, but um, you know, 0.6 to 0.8 grams per day. And also, because of the protein leverage hypothesis, it's important to keep in mind, it's also empowering to know that protein is, has been shown actually to be the most satiating of the macronutrients when compared to isocaloric, meaning uh, the same amount of calories from either pure carbohydrate or pure fat. So 
that's what I tend to reach for. I try to have a protein at every meal, and I find myself hitting those, those numbers. Kimberly, what about you? Ah, the protein question. <laughs> so this is a question that comes up all the time, uh, especially when you're plant-based. I, you know, we've gone through, Aaron mentioned there's been periods where fat was demonized. We saw that in the 80s. And then since about the 90s to now, we're, we're living in the age where carbohydrates have been demonized, whether it's through different iterations of Atkins, Paleo, South Beach diet, so on and so forth. But there's never been a period where protein has really been looked at. And so I feel like the common mentality is that you can't get enough, or you can't get too much, rather. And I think you can get too much. I think the problem is most people get way too much protein. The average woman only needs about 40 to 60 grams. We'll say there's different, um, there's different ratios than, you know, we can talk about that. Different organizations have put out different ratios. When you're pregnant, you need more. But the problem when you have too much protein, it's a huge digestive load. It takes a lot of energy. It's a lot of pressure on your kidneys and on your liver. And in essence, you age faster. That's what I see with a lot of clients, a lot of people that have gone years and years of eating protein in excessive quantities. Yes, you can lose weight. Yes, it can have some great short-term effects. But you start to see people harden, and you see their bodies harden. And also, it is a fact that toxins bioaccumulate as we go up the food chain. So even if something's organic and grass-fed and you know, you know, pasture-raised, it's still taking in a lot of toxins from the environment. So we know that 90% of dioxin exposure, for instance, comes from animal protein. And these are chemicals and um, just pollutants that really interfere with how our bodies function. So I find if you're eating enough calories, if you're trying to eat whole foods, it's more than, it's very easy to get enough protein. You don't have to try and eat huge quantities all through the day. I find when I relax more about it and I'm having my green smoothie, which actually does have protein too, I know when I went to Rwanda and I saw the gorillas that are the strongest animals on earth, pound for pound, and they're vegan. They eat a little bit of ants, but they're really eating greens all day and they're really big and they're really strong. And that's why I think a lot of athletes are becoming plant-based as well, because of the faster recovery time and less acid in their body. And so their cells are able to regenerate faster as well. So, you know, I just eat what I eat. I have kale salads, I have quinoa, I have brown rice, I have, you know, this and that. And when I added up for the day, my last book, uh, Radical Beauty, I actually wrote, tracked my diet and saw, wow, I'm actually having 56 grams of protein without really trying. So I just think it's, you know, we live in this world where it's like, protein, 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 and I think we can relax. If you're eating whole foods, if you're not eating processed junk, if you're not eating pasta every meal, you're gonna get enough protein. I'd like, can I add something? Yeah. Um, so I think uh, you're completely right um, in the fact that, you know, when we focus on muscle meat as a protein for the omnivores uh, in the audience, you know, muscle meat is really high in an amino acid called methionine, which is a essential amino acid. It's one of the nine essential amino acids that we actually need. But by sticking only to muscle meat, which is a modern convention, you know, we tend to prefer muscle meat as opposed to organ meats and ligaments and connective tissue and all the stuff that if you actually were to feed uh, a whole animal to a pack of wolves, the alpha wolf would actually go for the organs first and leave the muscle meat to the, uh, the betas, I guess the, the, the other dogs are called. So there's a really interesting line of research. It was done in animals, but they fed rats uh, a really high methionine-enriched diet, which is that, again, amino acid found in muscle meat. And it shortened their lifespans. Um, but then when they supplemented those high methionine diets with an amino acid found in collagen, that impact on the rat's lifespan was abolished. So what that says to me is that we actually have, and this is from an ecological standpoint, I think really interesting. We have a biological imperative to not be wasteful. So if we are consuming meat and things like that, we really need to consider the whole animal. It's gonna be better for the earth, better for the planet. It's a more karmically sound way to consume meat, i.e. to not be wasteful. And it shows that that is probably the healthiest way to consume meat as well. I love, uh I feel like non-American diets and non-American cuisines are very good at using, you know, nose to tail and making those organs, cooking them a little longer in a very specified way to make them delicious. And I feel like more and more, maybe American culinary scene will become 
you know, to understand that and learn that, hopefully. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add something. Um, if you guys are interested in understanding a little bit more about farming, regenerative farming, when it comes to eating an animal, nose to tail, when it comes to growing animals on a farm where they're also growing produce and they have ground cover, it's also, this is really important for global warming in general because our soil is actually made up if you look at fertilizer, it's made of blood and bone. So that's actually increasing the nutritional density of every soil on our planet. And the nutritional density of your soil actually has your plants' roots growing deeper, which sucks more carbon from the air into the ground. So there's a couple really amazing documentaries about how, you know, when you think about rainforest and you think about global warming, yes, industrially raised animals are causing a lot of carbon dioxide to go out into the, into the air, but also, growing loads of industrial rice and using all that water supply can also be damaging. And it really needs to go back to, we need to go back and look at the whole planet and how are we, how are we increasing the health of our whole planet? And I think, you know, a couple great resources for you guys if you're interested in it is Kiss the Ground and the Savory Institute. Those are, they're both putting out amazing information about how we can better the earth together, whether we're plant-based or protein-based. I mean, for me personally, I consider myself more of a consultant. I have raw vegan clients, I have paleo keto clients, and I, it's about respecting whatever is right for them and just making sure that there aren't deficiencies, that they're getting 56 grams of protein easily or that they're getting vitamin D or omega-3 um, levels just to keep inflammation at bay and take care of their body. So whatever is like, is right for you personally, I think look inside yourself and look at everything as a tool. Like if you are a Bulletproof Coffee person, that's a tool. If you're a glowing green smoothie person, that's a tool. Intermittent fasting is a tool. But this isn't, there isn't one size fits all. It isn't your religion. Don't preach it like it is because it might change and you have to change with the research and you have to be willing to accept that um, new, important, unbiased information is coming out to better us and to better our, our children maybe. So. Great. And I will say also a great resource is Paul Hawken. I don't know if you guys have heard of him, but he's done a lot of amazing, really deep level statistical research on saving the planet instead of all the doom and gloom we hear, like it's over. Um, and I think four of his top 12 initiatives are food-based. Um, so we know food is very impactful on the environment. I also say another documentary that I love, if you guys haven't seen it, is Cowspiracy. It's on Netflix. Check it out. <laughs> also, I'm just gonna say More Like Honey is a great documentary that everyone should see. There's what so More Like Honey, More Than Honey, it's on the More bees. Than Honey. It's on the bees, it's yeah. so good. Okay, so my next question, uh, let's start you with you again, Max. Paleo and keto are very, very popular diets right now. As the editor of Livestrong.com, we know what people are searching for and it's keto, keto, keto everything. Um, what do you say to someone who wants to try either paleo or keto? Is this just a trend or a fad or is it a sustainable way to eat and to live? Yeah, I, um, so I advise, I mean, you know, uh, my disclosure is that I tend to advise, and in my book I do this, intermittent ketosis. So I think it's just as unusual from a physiological standpoint to be chronically out of ketosis as it is to be chronically in ketosis. I think that we have, you know, our bodies uh, evolved with varying levels of food scarcity and, you know, we weren't always in ketosis. That being said, um, you know, what, and also, you know, another disclosure, my, my, my true passion is uh, brain health, dementia prevention, um, and really supporting the optimal functioning and health span of the brain. And so from a brain standpoint, um, ketones are incredibly interesting. I mean, the research on ketones is so compelling, um, both as an alternate fuel source for the brain, but also as a sort of anti-aging sign signaling molecule. And so, you know, I do think that the fact that people are becoming interested in keto is a good thing, but there's a lot of myths surrounding it. One of the myths that I uh, really like to debunk is that you need to eat lots of fat and fat bombs to be in ketosis. You can actually be... Yeah, you can actually be in deep ketosis consuming no fat whatsoever because it's a natural physiological response of the body to starvation. When we try to enter nutritional ketosis, obviously we want to eat things that don't spike insulin, which basically, um, you know, causes ketone production to come to a grinding halt. But, 
you know, I think it's very possible. And what I try to do is I try to eat a very vegetable-rich diet. I don't think about my ketone levels or anything like that, um, while also allowing your brain to intermittently use ketones as a fuel, which I think is probably very beneficial. Anyone else want to comment on the keto trend? Yes. Oh. All right. <laughs> um, so I think that when we look at research, there's validity to all these different diets. It goes back to what your goal is, how you want to feel. For me, I know, you know, it's not just about being thin. I went down that path for many years. I was obsessed with getting skinny. I tried every diet. I tried Atkins. I had eating disorders. And when I did get thin, I was still really anxious and I wasn't really happy. So to me, it's more about a lifestyle and getting food out of the way. I mean, you can enjoy being with your friends, but so I'm not obsessed with it. And any diet where I can't eat any carbs or I can't eat a banana when I want to eat it or I can't eat all this stuff is interfering too much with my life at this point. I'm not happy. I think too much, too much of my brain is consumed with obsessing over my diet. And I find when people eat these, what I consider to be more extreme diets, where we cut out whole categories of food, they start to just feel deprivation, they start to obsess. Is it long-term a lifestyle? I don't know, I know it's not how I wanna live long-term. But you know, for some people it might be the right way, but I would rather take a more balanced approach. I eat whole foods, I eat protein, I eat some fat, I eat carbs, and I just try to eat organic. I make you know, balanced choices and I don't obsess. So for me that works better because I've come to see over all the, you know, the past decade, my first few books were really focused on food. Then it started to be more about energy and how we feel and our mind and spirituality and emotions. And coming from someone that got skinny and still wasn't happy, I think wellness is a lot more than the way we are. Absolutely, and food can be a very joyous thing instead of yes. something you should fear. Go and to Italy, eat some pasta. <laughs> I'm doing that in a couple weeks, no yes. lies. Um, okay, so I'm gonna point this at you, Kelly. There has been a lot of talk recently about gut health and how it affects mood and mental health. What is the correlation between gut health and mental health? Yeah, um, there was actually a study with about 7,000 women that went for 12 years, and it was looking at gut health, an anti-inflammatory diet with um, wild proteins, healthy fats, but it was primarily plant-based. And when we talk about primarily plant-based, um, I think we can all agree that plants, whether looking at our plate, are, should cover half our plate at least, um, because immediately when you're eating those plants, within two hours, your gut microbiome is changing. So you're proliferating cells. We used to think it would take months or years to change that ecosystem, but you're seeing change within two hours of consumption of a meal, and consistency is way more important to that ecosystem. But in the study, they looked at, unfortunately, the sad American diet, right? That's not great for anybody. Fast food, um, kind of what, you know, people grabbing packaged foods, maybe it has industrial seed oils, maybe it has added sugars. Um, but what they found was over 12 years, it came down to the gut-brain axis and how healthy was their gut microbiome. And the people who ate an anti-inflammatory diet versus an inflammatory diet had a 20% less likelihood of any mental uh, illness in regards to depression, anxiety, and stress disorders. So it was really interesting, and, and I think when you look down the line of, of experts here today, they're all preaching an anti-inflammatory diet. They're all preaching uh, gut health, and it really is just about consistency, whether you're plant-based or you're keto, and back to the keto thing, there's many times where I see people cut out vegetables like carrots because they have too much sugar and they want to be keto. And I think that that's equally unhealthy because you're missing those antioxidants or those phytochemicals that can really set off genetic pathways. So the gut, your gut health is absolutely 100% correlated to your brain health. Obviously, we talked about serotonin production and neurotransmitter production in the gut, but it's all those short chain fatty acids that when our probiotic, probiotic bacteria eats and ferments those veggies, they give off and we're healthier for it. Absolutely. All right, I got a last question for all of you. Um, looking forward, is there a new ingredient or health trend that we should all be on the lookout for? <laughs> I know that's a hard one. 
Well, I'll jump on there. So I think that you look at there's so much out there and you can get so overwhelmed with what's right for you, whether it be keto, paleo, plant-based. You have to do what's right for you. You know, Everything we're doing, everything all of us want is that we want to improve the health uh, of ourselves and everyone that we work with. And so it really comes down to an individual choice. What are you going to do for life? And I think it's there's a big trend now to body love, acceptance at every size. And I think that's wonderful because it really shouldn't be about the number. Being skinny isn't going to give you happiness and it's not always going to be healthy. Uh, you really have to focus on what are those changes you can sustain for life. And if you can see yourself following a ketogenic diet for two weeks, that's not sustainable. You're not going to make long-term changes. So I really think the trend is, is focusing more on the individualized needs, what's right for you. I mean, even today I'm over like at the Swiss booth with information on, you know, talking about individual um, diets because it really comes down to the fact that every single one of us is unique and every one of us have different lifestyles, different preferences. So you really have to find what's realistic for you, start small and builds up because if you do too much at once you just burn out so with everything it's just taking it one step at the time and your gut becomes healthier and overall you become healthier awesome. Kelly do you want to chime in I mean the only other thing that I would mention is um, I think there's a lot of information and people are putting a lot out on Instagram and there's so many amazing like food blogs that you can follow and grab recipes I'd be careful of the healthy foods, the coined healthy foods. It's gluten-free, it's dairy-free, it's vegan, um, because you really have to know the ingredients. Like, how far away from it, it, how far away is it from the whole food? So when they look at gut health, and I'm a big proponent of gut health, but when you look at cellular versus acellular products, and what does that mean? So a cellular product is a whole food where the food you're eating is wrapped in its fiber cell, and an acellular product is something that becomes a flour first. So for example, it could be garbanzo bean flour pasta, it could be um, crackers, a certain type of tortilla or chip. It became a flour first, and so when it comes in contact with your hydrochloric acid and your enzymes, it becomes a really sugary chyme. So what you're putting from your stomach into your intestines is actually a lot of sugary and, and uh, covers a lot of surface area. So the overgrowth of bad bacteria and the overfeeding of that bacteria um, can happen. So just because something is gluten-free or dairy-free or new or hip or you're seeing a lot of money behind a brand, just be aware of it and when in doubt, go back to the whole food because as nature intended it, whether it's a grain um, or a vegetable or a fruit, in its whole form, it's slowing down the digestion of that sugar and you're not overfeeding that microbiome. It's really an ecosystem that you can't feed quickly. You shouldn't, you know, it's from colonics to probiotics to prebiotics to really um, aggressive antibiotics unless you have a, a bacterial infection. I think you just wanna be really delicate because it's doing so much for your body and your brain every single day and consistency will always, always, always outpace some kind of fad, quick, fast thing. Great. Max? Oh, man. Well, okay, so this might sound like the most controversial thing that I've said, but... Uh, Great, we welcome that. This is not an endorsement for this trend, but I am interested in the anecdotes that have bubbled up uh, from the, the, the dark nutrition web of people seemingly thriving on carnivore diets, meaning no plants whatsoever. And uh, I don't recommend this diet, um, but I, I am intellectually fascinated by it because people with uh, really severe cases of autoimmunity seem to really have a, an almost reversal of symptoms when they cut out plants. And I think this is really interesting and something that I hope that research looks into. But uh, the way that I'm sort of starting to think about it is, you know, in a perfect world, plants would all, we would all react extremely well to plants. You know, plants have compounds in them that they develop as insecticides that actually in a healthy person serve as a stressor that actually causes us to become more robust and healthier and acts like antioxidants and, and things like that. But because we live in a time where so many of us have widespread immune dysfunction, you know, autoimmunity is on the rise. Uh, so many of us have allergies and sensitivities and things like that because we've placed the microbiome as a sort of afterthought, right? Many of us are born uh, far, a far greater proportion than medically required are born via 
uh, C-section, antibiotics are overprescribed. So we all have, you know, essentially gut dysbiosis, which is a dysfunctional immune system, or which leads to a dysfunctional immune system, because the gut, our microbiome, is essentially the train training camp for our body's immune system. So I think for susceptible people, certain plant compounds like gluten, lectins, we've all heard of lectins uh, these days, might actually uh, initiate something called molecular mimicry in a susceptible person. And so for somebody with a dysfunctional immune system, and we don't really have a definition of what that is for the purposes of this argument, I would say somebody with an autoimmune condition, it might be the case that perhaps temporarily removing plants, I don't know, might help. There's zero research, and it's just a small handful of case studies and anecdotes popping up on the internet. But I think that a healthy model of biology and health has to be able to reconcile the fact that we do know that plants are incredibly good for us and vegetables are incredibly good for us. But at the same time, these reports of people thriving, I mean, we should kind of listen and think about them for a second. So that would be my you know, interesting trend that I just want to throw out there. I like, very controversial, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say, how long have they been studied doing that? Well, well they, they haven't been studied. They haven't been studied, but um, you know, people like with, with strong autoimmune conditions, being able to try a diet, just try a diet as opposed to having to go on some immunosuppressant drug. I mean, try every diet. But I just think it's like one more tool that we can kind of think about and use you know, in our arsenal to feel better at the end of the day, I don't know. And more research is never bad, so if there is this trend among people, why not research it and see if it's a valuable tool? Yeah, there's no, there's no research, but you know, N of one anecdotal reports, I still think, you know, I'll give you just another quick example. One of the earliest uh, proponents of using coconut oil as a potential treatment for Alzheimer's disease when there was no studies on the link between ketones and brain function in Alzheimer's disease was a neonatologist named Mary Newport, who back when, you know, I'm really interested in this topic because my mother has dementia, and I've become obsessed with uh, truth-seeking, but also doing it in a way that adheres to the science, and I try to remain as open-minded as I can, but, you know, for somebody dealing with a complex condition for which there is no cure, I mean, I think it's important to be open-minded to anything, right? So when I first discovered Mary Newport, she had a husband diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, and she began giving him tablespoons of coconut oil, and she became a viral phenomena on the internet. And, uh, you know, anybody who sees this is gonna be like, what, this is ridiculous, you know? We have pharma can't even come up with a cure for Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease drug trials have a 99% fail rate. Coconut oil is gonna help, but actually, you know, the research has since sort of come out in support of ketones and medium chain triglycerides as a potential alternate brain fuel. So, you know, I don't, I think that one of the keys to thinking like a scientist, which we should all kind of do in our lives, you know, knowing that we're each N of one experiments, is to remain skeptical, but never cynical, you know? And if it's gonna help you, and it's gonna keep you off of a drug potentially with horrible side effects, then like, why not? You know, I'm not dogmatic. I'm just like, you know, just try things. Awesome. We'll end with you. Um, so when we think about trends, there's things that come and go, but I like to think about long-term trends, and I think about where we're going as a society, as people, because I don't think food can be completely divorced from that. So when you look at the world today, I am very excited and thrilled and happy to see that there's this rise of consciousness. There's more people interested in meditation. There's more people doing yoga. There's more people practicing mindfulness, whatever that means, different apps, different programs. And I see with young people, you know, when I would go to Krakow, Poland, and Berlin, and I was just in Costa Rica up until a few hours ago, I'm seeing this rise with young people, teenagers, late teenagers. And I know I'm biased towards this, but I do see this rise in plant-based. I see this rise in compassion and people being aware that when there's a bioenergetic quality to food, and if you're putting lots of dead animals with dead beings in your body, it's going to affect your energy. It's just going to affect beyond calories and protein and things like that. There's just an energy that we don't really understand. So I do, th you know, I went to the Expo West Food Show last, this 
March, and I went last March, and I was amazed how this March, plant-based was crazy huge. You're seeing all this innovation companies like Beyond Meat, Impossible Burgers, more processed, but making it more available to people as a transition away from meat. And it's amazing what I'm seeing with young people. People are watching documentaries like Cowspiracy and What the Health and really caring about the earth and not just thinking about their bodies. So I think long term, my hope and my belief is that there will be more plant-based. Wonderful. Well, thank you guys all so much for being here today. I learn about this stuff every day and I learn something new from this panel. So thank you all for being here.